Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 34th episode of the Exploring Antinatalism podcast, a podcast all about the subject of antinatalism created by antinatalists. My name is Amanda Oldfan Sukunik, also known as Forever Wolf Films on YouTube. And I'm Mark J. Maharaj, also known as Question Mark on YouTube. And today, we're speaking with Honorary Fellow at the Department of Philosophy at University of York and author of several books, including The Value and Meaning of Life, as well as the article A New Argument for Antinatalism, Christopher Belshaw. Just a really quick message before we begin the episode. I just want to give a quick explanation and apology that I am mostly not present for this episode. Um, unfortunately, while we were recording, my internet connection was just awful and giving me all kinds of problems. Um, to the extent the extent of which is that I you know when I was editing the episode is when I mostly got to hear um what was said at all so um but in any case uh, it's a very interesting conversation uh, Mark and Dr. Belshaw do an excellent job and I'm very grateful to them uh so much I wish I could have said bit of a missed opportunity but I leave you in uh, both of their very capable hands uh please enjoy the episode thank you so much uh welcome to the Exploring Antinatalism podcast Dr. Belshaw it's a pleasure to have you pleasure to be here so let me just uh, start out by asking uh, some basic questions. Um, in your words, who is uh, Dr. Belshaw? Who is Dr. Belshaw? Oh, he's um, a chap who uh, has been in philosophy for a fair while um, in the north of England and the middle of California. So I'm from Yorkshire and I've not lived really anywhere else in England, but I did do my graduate work in Santa Barbara, which gave me a new look on on my existence i think yeah so that's that's basically who he is i'm um, yeah he's a kind of country lover as well and and a kind of animal lover too which um, <laughs> may, may surprise some people <laughs> are you an antinatalist dr belshaw and if so why and if not why um i think that there's strength in and um, the arguments for antinatalism I don't think I want to put my hand up and say I'm an antinatalist for all sorts of reasons, because uh, people will take me to be rather pessimistic about human existence. I don't want to be pessimistic about human existence, but I think there are some the strength in, in antinatalist arguments, given a certain spin. How did you get involved in philosophy? I was at a school where nobody ever spoke about philosophy. It wasn't a subject. So I didn't even know there was such a subject as philosophy until I started to date a school teacher, which you're not supposed to do, right? <laughs> she told, she told, she'd done philosophy. She'd done philosophy and uh, English at Durham. So she told me what philosophy was. And by that time, I was already kind of signed up to do music at university but i soon i started sitting on on some philosophy classes and found that that was where i wanted to be and my guitar practice wasn't going very well anyway so what the heck what areas of specialty do you um do you gravitate towards philosophy yeah oh what i say is it's the theoretical side of applied ethics okay so i mean i guess the, the what i gravitate towards is the stuff in the books value and meaning of life environment, animals, personal identity. Um, you are the author of two works on the subject of antinatalism, A New Argument for Antinatalism, which was an article, uh, and you have a chapter about antinatalism in your book, The Value and Meaning of Life. Um, can you tell me a little bit about these two works and maybe a little bit about how you became interested in working with the subject of antinatalism? Well, I'll start with a second question. So um, having my breakfast, I'm um, there's a thing on the radio, just a you know kind of news current affairs program, and they they talk about the books that have been shortlisted for the there's some book of the year with the weird title competition, and Benatar's book was a runner up. I think the winner was something like abandoned shopping carts of the northwest, a field user's guide. But I think Benatar came third in that. So I thought that sounds interesting. And I don't know anything about shopping carts, but I know a little bit about this. So I got hold of the book and found it interesting, of course. And uh, I, I confess I wrote um, a not, not massively generous uh, review of the book. Oh, yeah. And, and Benatar wrote a not massively generous reply. <laughs> but, but, but we are now on speaking terms. That's good. Good to hear. 
Um, so I'd like to ask you a few questions in regard to promortalism, which is the subject of, of uh, a lot of what you, you write about in terms of antinatalism. And I was, I was wondering if you could tell me a, uh, anything about what you may know about the history of the term. Um, I'm, we'll sort of get to it further in a bit, but um, I'm, I'm, I hadn't heard this term until fairly recently. Uh, I would say in the last like two years, it sort of exploded within the antinatalist uh, internet world. Um, and there's been a lot of discussion about sort of where it's where it's come from. So I'm just curious if you you sort of know anything about its origins. The origins of the term pro mortalism. Yes, I don't think I don't think I know anything really about that. Um, I found myself using it, and at one point I thought, where have I got this term from? And I'm not sure that I really know. I think I think Benatar uses it. Yeah, he he does. I I, I was surprised to find. So yeah, no, it's a uh, it's a bit of a mystery. Well, Benatar so, said he didn't even know how he came up with antinatalism. It's uh, that's true too. Yeah, <laughs> it's just a uh, common usage, I guess, when you're um, getting involved in these journal papers uh, using the terms back and forth. Um, I wanted to go back to your the the question Amanda asked beforehand about your two works on antinatalism. How did you? Was there like a call for papers for that uh, symposium on antinatalism in the South African Journal of Philosophy? The we wrote a new argument for antinatalism, I believe. Um, yes, there was. I remember that. Yeah, there was a call for papers. I, I put this in and it was accepted. Okay. A and colleague of mine, a colleague of mine at York also put one in and it wasn't accepted. Oh, sorry okay. to hear that. <laughs> and and was it was it was that journal ever released in hard copy? Because I've been trying to find it and it seems like it's only only exists in the world of PDF. Um <laughs> No, it's this. Yeah, it's hard copy. I've got hard copy. It's just, it's just, um, you know, the um, one of the volumes in the South African Journal. Uh, yeah. Just Could you expand it. a little bit more on that particular paper about uh, a, a new argument of antinatalism? Can I expand on it? Um, or, or uh, possibly like a, a, a summary, if that's possible. Well, look, I mean, you mentioned pro-mortalism. I think that, I mean, I think that the, the puzzle in, in Benatar is why, given that he says that it's so bad to come into existence, and we can talk about what that means, why is it, why, why hang around? You know, why not do the suicide thing? And I thought that what he says about that is not satisfactory, right? Um, but there's got to be, I mean, it seems right that, it would be kind of weird for us to go out and kill ourselves on the basis of this argument. And if you look around at what, how life goes, it doesn't seem that bad. So there's got to be something wrong. And it seemed to me that what was, you either throw the whole antinatalism thing out or you stick with it and try to make some sense of this antinatalism, pro-mortalism distinction. And it seemed to me that the way to do that was to focus more on the kinds of beings that we're talking about. Right. And then there seems to me to be a big difference between persons and non-persons. Yeah, and you've talked about this in your... Um, I don't know when you were uh, on this panel about um, animal ethics with Peter Singer and a couple of others at the, what is it, Institute of Ideas, something like that, yeah. um, where you've talked about uh, you know, your view about um, non-human animals not having a... I don't know what to call it, like a future sense of self, um, or a future, or an idea of a future state, right? And therefore, they wouldn't be qualified as persons, correct? Yeah. Okay. So, but that's not that. that that's not absolutely the point. The, the point there is that they don't. My my thought is that they don't have desires to live in the future, right? And because they're not persons, they don't have desires to live. It's not. It's not the other way around. I mean, because I could be. I could have no desires for the future, but I'd still be a person. Right, right. You have the capacity for that. To have the desires for the future. Yeah. Yeah. Does Benetarian antinatalism, the framework that he's working with, in your view, does that necessarily imply pro-mortalism, the way that he defends it? I don't think, I don't think the way he defends it, it implies pro-mortalism, but there is a question. It, ra it raises the question, or leaves room for the question, of why not? Why do we not kill ourselves? And I don't think it gives an answer to it. I don't think it gives a satisfactory answer to it. Uh, his basic asymmetry would that would that imply promortalism? No. No. The basic. Okay. I, I take it the basic asymmetry, and it's not a hundred percent clear what he means. But I take it the basic asymmetry is the kind of asymmetry that 
um, Jeff McMahon, I guess, introduced, right, which says that there are reasons against starting bad lives and there are there are not reasons for good lives. That's okay. the basic asymmetry, right? Um, that, allow, that allows that lives can be good and it allows that when they're in existence, there can be reasons to continue with them. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that's, um, the, that's the basic asymmetry then. So, so Benatar wants to get to a point where he wants to say from, from this basic asymmetry, it's not simply that on, on good lives, he wants to say they too are forbidden. We shouldn't start the, the overall good lives, but once they're in existence, we should continue with them. And I don't think he can explain that. I don't think he can explain that. And you offer a alternative or a, I don't know if this is appropriate to say, but a stronger version of, um, of that argument. Is that correct? Well, stronger is always a bit ambiguous, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I, I offer a, a weaker version, which is therefore a stronger version. I mean, I offer a version which is more defensible. That's the claim. That's the right. thought. Yeah. Okay. On the internet, at least, uh, th this term promortalism is applied to a really huge number of circumstances, it seems. Um, and for that reason, I often find it kind of confusing what people really mean uh, when they use it. How would you define the term promortalism? Well, um, for death. We're for death. If Just you're a promortalist. Death. Yeah. Well, I feel like there's a distinction to be made that is death a harm? Is it a bad thing? Um, or is it a good thing that someone ceases to exist versus imposing that on another person? Some people take pro-mortalism to say that we it necessarily implies um, taking a life. Like taking a life would be good for the person if death is good. Um, or and with immediacy. And with immediacy. Like it's, it's, it's yeah. good to die as soon as possible. So this is where I've seen um, different articulations of the word pro-mortalism. And, and, and I've seen it applied to capital punishment, to abortion, to murder, to suicide. And it just seems it seems almost too broad at times. Uh, and maybe that's appropriate. Yeah, well, uh, maybe I don't have enough thoughts for you on this one. I mean, if I if I describe myself as a pro mortalist, then I think I would have an obligation to, to, to make clear in what circumstances, whether it's some particular circumstances or across the board, whether I'm for death, you know, and whether I'm for involuntary death, whatever. Um, but I'm not a pro-mortalist, right? Um, so I'm not sure that I'm under this obligation to, to make massively clear what I take the term to mean. Mm -hmm. You have to push me a bit and, and I'll find that I do, right? But Well, Amanda, did you want to expand on that? Because that goes into the other question that I want to ask. Um, yeah, I mean, I can talk a little bit about... Um sort of my big question. So speaking a little to your example of euthanizing, you know, babies, like, so I personally believe it's, it's always better for the machine to be off rather than on, right? Like if something is alive, it's at risk of suffering and that's bad. And when it's uh, dead or never brought into existence in the first place and the chance of harm is not there, it, that's good. Or, you know, never started in the first place, that's a good thing. Um, and I think that's just a sort of a sad, you know, inconvenient, truth of the world. Um, and certainly, again, in the example of, of an infant or very young child and not yet sentient child, there's plenty of situation where the prognosis is, is bad enough that I think a pro-mortalist euthanasia, right to die, mercy killing uh, approach is absolutely the right prescription. And I wish that wasn't such a controversial statement. We put a lot of little kids through a lot of hell. Um, but where I become a little frustrated with pro-mortalism, at least in the example like this, sort of has to do with what I think of like as the speed of pro-mortalism, that you have the statement of better for the one that dies, but then there's this added kind of implication that it must be right now, die now, death now. Um, and yes, in some cases, sure. Um, but what I kind of wish happened in more discussions of pro-mortalism is less the immediate action that an honest recognition of the fact that the machine would be best turned off, but that an alternative route is also recognized that we work harder to make graceful exits more accessible, right? The die should be more of a thing that's, that's, that's worked towards. Sort of two questions here. Do you believe that it would be pro mortalist to say, be a right to die activist, um, you know, sort of a more practical application of pro mortalism perhaps? Um, or am I changing the meaning in your view of pro mortalism so much that I'm not describing it accurately um 
I don't think I have a strong view on it. I think if you if you if you describe yourself as a pro mortalist and say you're for death, then people are going to raise their eyebrows, right? So you need to explain what it is you mean and in what circumstances you're for death. And right. my view is that to be in favour of youth voluntary, let's say at least for, to start with, if to say you're in favour of voluntary euthanasia in certain circumstances ought not to be seen as a massively controversial claim, right? If you're talking about babies, then it's involuntary euthanasia or non-voluntary. I'm not clear about that di distinction. Um, and I think that you can be in favour of that without being in a massively controversial position, right? Yeah. If you say I'm in favour of death of those who appear to have happy lives, right? I'm in favour of death of everyone who's around now. That's a much more controversial position. Sure, of course, but no, I would I, I would be of the, right. I don't I don't want to say that the term has it should be used in this area, not that area. I just think that people, you, yeah. if you're going to use that term, you're under some pressure to make clear what what you're talking about. Um, I just wanted to clarify something in both, um, well, the the paper and your book, with um, when you said uh, babies uh, not being persons, and how. If they're in a state of, and you compared it to rabbits, right? That uh, if an animal or a baby was in in pain, and, and, and let me go to the animal one because it's easier to conceptualize. Uh, an animal's in pain, um, but in the future, we can do a surgery to help this animal and they would have like 20 good years of life uh, uh, afterwards. There would be, from what I understood that this would this wouldn't necessarily be a good thing. It would be good for them to die. Is that correct? And and withhold that treatment because they have no sense of future self or, or the future or des future desires. So the thought is it's in pain now. It's in pain into the at least the immediate future. But in the further future, we could give it a good life then my view is that there's no reason to give it a good life. So there's, there's no reason to prolong the pain. Do you see that as a controversial view? Yeah. Okay. So when it comes to the marginal cases argument for animal rights, how does that play into that argument with what you just said? Remind me what the marginal case uh, is. So, so like if, uh, if, there's, um, if there are cases of such babies, uh, cognitively impaired people, what is true of the animal that if you put it to the human uh, would make it the case uh, okay to kill the human. Um, and so, so far it seems like the qualification there is personhood status, that the animal doesn't have personhood status and the, uh, the infant doesn't have personhood status. Therefore, if it's in pain, then we, we, we shouldn't um, like do a surgery or uh, or save its life, um, it would be okay to euthanize it. Yeah, that's... Um, so, like, would that happen in the marginal cases of humans as well? My view would be that in the case of human beings, so talk about babies or fetuses if they're in pain, and there's a future good life down the road, that's not a reason to keep them alive. But I want to, I will, I mean, I do say that this, this is, if we're looking at things just from the point of view of what is good for this organism, then we wouldn't keep it alive, we would end its life. But I don't think we should be looking at things just from the point of view of what's good for the organism. Okay. We've got to take you know everything else into context. Okay. Does that sound wrong to you? Yes. <laughs> um, but I feel like I want, I, I want to come back to this a little bit later. So within the, the book, it, it sounds like it's been a lot of, to me, it sounds like a, um, um, how do I put this? A, it sounds utilitarian, the way these, these calculations were going back and forth. And I was curious, um, what is your normative theory of ethics? Or were you just arguing for that because antinatalism tends to come across as utilitarian? I said, uh, the question about what's my normative theory of ethics, um... I've been thinking about this recently. I don't, I don't, I'm not, I'm not going to buy into any of these. My, I've got more sympathies with utilitarianism okay. than other theories. But I mean, I think that you know, utilitarianism gets controversial when it allegedly, 
I mean, the total view, there are different versions of, to, of utilitarianism. And the kind of total view, um, I don't buy that at all. I'm sympathetic to utilitarianism because I'm sympathetic to view to the view that pains and pleasures are what matter. I'm sim I, I, there's a sense which I want to say I'm a hedonist or, a, 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 you know, mental states are what matter. That's what I think. And that leaves a lot open, right, as to killing people for the sake of other people and aggregating and bringing people into existence. All that is up for grabs if you say that mental states are what matter. When it comes to the view on death and whether or not it's good, neutral, bad, whatever, um, what do you? what is your position on the badness of death? Are you a epicurean a deprivationist something else like you wrote a book on annihilation right yeah well a kind of deprivationist but again i think that it we need we need a kind of augmented deprivation account because we need the, the view that it's bad for you when you want to live when you've got okay when you've got a good life ahead of you and you want it then death is bad for you that's that's the basic right view right so having a good life ahead of you which is the deprivation view is not sufficient to make death bad, you've got to want to live. And wanting to live is not sufficient either because it, you, it could be just a bad life ahead of you. Oh. So it's augmented deprivationism. Okay. I don't think I've ever said that before. I don't. I like that. I like it too. Yeah, I like the term. <laughs> In your paper, you mentioned that you have your own antinatalistic asymmetry. I was curious if you could detail your asymmetry for us. And while we would certainly not expect you to, you know, grab pencil and paper and draw a diagram on the fly for us, um, what might be one way of representing your asymmetry visually? Would it? Would, do you think it would look similarly to Benatar's axiological asymmetry with his four squares? Well. I think that I've said what I think the asymmetry is, and that's the, you know, the simple view that starting bad lives is forbidden, starting good lives is permitted but not required. Okay. And now, um, to talk about Benatar and the Matrix, I think that's, that's been given a lot of um, attention, and I think that if we um, want to be at all generous to him and it, we can say basically what that's saying is just the same point. Okay, I don't think. I sorry, I don't think I've answered your question really. But push me a bit more, and and we'll get there. I'm sure. No, that's okay. I I mean I I just got the sense that what you you were proposing a bit of a different asymmetry than than he was, and uh... I've got things to say about his asymmetry. I mean, one thing is it's not clear. He starts off by talking about the asymmetry as though it's well understood, and it seems to be. It seems to be that he's given us what I've just given you, which is the McMahon view. And then he, what he says is that if, if you accept this asymmetry, what follows is antinatalism. And that's the kind of slightly strange claim, right? And so we need to see how that's made out. Okay, so you're, you're saying that he's sort of smuggling in the antinatalism. It, just, it doesn't quite follow from, from what he's saying his asymmetry is. I think that my view has changed a little bit on this, right? Um, okay. I think my, my view used to be that, yes, that's what he was doing, that he was making a, an illicit and too quick move from the McMahon position to the Benetop position, right? I'm now more sympathetic to, as I say, to an antinatalist argument. So I think it's not a mistake to think that the, the McMahon view and the Benetop view are fairly closely connected, but I don't think he shows how, I don't think he, shows how they're connected. Well, let me let me move on a little bit. Um, a friend of ours, Maud, uh, submitted a question. Do you view identity and or personhood as a continuous process or a sequence of discontinuities? Yeah, it's curious about what your view on personal identity and consciousness is, because uh, mm. I'm, I'm not, I can't off the top of my head remember all the views, but I'm curious about uh, what your view on that is. Okay, my view on personal identity is that two views, two fairly common views, are neither of them correct. So one view is that we're essentially persons, and another view is that we're essentially animals. And I don't think we're essentially either of those. I th okay, um, I think that there's a nosic view, closest continuous theory, and I'm kind of sympathetic to that. So if you've got a person at on Tuesday, you've got a person around on Tuesday, and then there's someone else around on 
Wednesday, is it the same person? I think if it's close enough and there aren't duplicates and stuff like that, then we will say yes. And what we say, if we're fair, careful enough, will be true. It's a kind of deflationist account of personal identity. Okay. Does that make sense? I'm not familiar with uh, that last term that you mentioned, the deflationist. Yeah. What does that mean? Um, I mean that I want to kind of bring it down to the level of asking ordinary everyday questions. I think there are ordinary everyday questions we can ask and we can answer. Um, I'm a kind of skeptic about metaphysics, right? Okay. Okay. Um, just to clarify, so is this a is identity or personhood like a, a continuous view? I mean, I mean, identity over time, if we talk about identity over time, Am I am I allowing there can be gaps? Yeah, I allow that there can be gaps. Right. I allow. I I think you, one person could go out of existence and come back into existence. If... Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, thank you. Um, just out of curiosity, I'm. I was just curious if you had sort of explored uh, more antinatalist works outside of Benatar. Is that something that interests you at all? Have you ever read uh, Julio Cabrera, no. for instance? Okay. Okay. Oh, fair enough. That's sort of cool. Um. I was wondering if I could ask you a little bit about your position on human extinction. What is your, what is your position on human extinction? Um, that's a good question. I, I did three seminars on this yesterday. Oh, wow. With, with my that's students. Awesome. Good timing. Yeah, so we've been talking about this. Um, my view on human extinction is that for fairly straightforward reasons, there could come circumstances in which that's a good thing to do. It's good for us to go extinct. Um, I don't think those circumstances are around now, but there's a more, maybe a more subtle view in which we could go. The, th the thing I've been toying, the idea I've been toying around with is um, maybe it would be good for us to go extinct for kind of quasi aesthetic reasons, maybe if we find that living meaningful lives is not no longer possible. Okay. Um... So I, think, I think people could live, you know, pleasant. We could have a, a future in which people live pleasant lives, maybe kind of happy lives, but they're basically meaningless. We, as a species or as a culture, are not going anywhere. And we might think in the circumstances that exiting the stage is the best thing to do. We might think that. Is that what your view is? Sorry if I misunderstood that. Um, I don't think we're in a position where at the moment where we could say, we should say that we'll all live in meaningless lives, but we could get there in the future. Meaningless, what do meaning, you... sorry. Well, I mean, it's, it's no. interesting. I think it connects with, you know, the, this thing about the, you know, the usual spiel about immortality is that immortality would be bad because, well, this is the kind of boredom claim. And then there's the kind of Schaefflerian claim of, you know, trivial and shallow lives. Right? That's actually where I was going to go with, um, how would you respond to Scheffler and his arguments? Um, I think it's a pretty good argument, but I think like most of his arguments, it's exaggerated, right? So I think um, he's got this argument about death, right? Um, and I think that, so he's got, this, he's got a chapter on the, on the death stuff, and he's got a chapter on the extinction stuff. And I've been dealing with both of them, and at the moment I'm not keeping them well enough apart. But I think there are similarities in them. He thinks that if we, if we know that we're going to go extinct, we would be cast into the irredeemable depths of depression. I think that's exaggerated. Okay. Yeah, because we we do already know that we're going we're going to go extinct. Well, his thought is if we, no, the th the thought is if we're going to go extinct soon, we'd be cast into the depths oh, of depression. Obviously. And I think that's I mean, you know, people thought nuclear annihilation was around the corner, and it didn't stop them eating cakes. Right. 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 Okay. So, I mean, you mentioned something to the effect of if our lives became meaningless, then human extinction would be a good prescription. What, what, would, what, is, what in your view, is, is giving us meaning right now, and how could we lose that meaning in the future? Well, this is where I, I was wanting to be sympathetic to this. I'm not altogether committed to it, but the Schaefflerian line on immortality that... If we're going on forever, everything becomes trivial and shallow and therefore meaningless, seems plausible, right? And then the question is, well, if, if life is meaningless, do you, what, does that mean you'd rather not go on? And that's, that's also not implausible to suggest that, right? And so then that's just 
ramp that up to a species level, right? So I think that we can imagine the future where everything is trivial and shallow. And sometimes when I'm in um, a certain kind of mood, I might think that's not far away, right? So I was t I was teasing my students about Netflix, I guess, right? So it used to be the case that you had to work, you had to do some work to see a film, right? And now you don't, you just press a button and you see whatever film you want, whatever yeah. you want. Right, so that's the kind of way in which you might think that life is becoming easy, you know? So you get rid of, I mean, okay, so the path it's got a little bit about extinction, how bad it would be, and we should carry on, um, and we can make moral progress and scientific progress. And then you think, but look, if, if you get everything sorted out, that's like being in heaven. You know, there's no diseases and there are no wars and you can get films just by pressing a button. Um, and everything is perfect. They think that would be kind of trivial and shallow, right? I don't, I don't want to go to heaven because it's not very interesting. What, why so if it, all becomes, if it all becomes trivial and shallow, then for the species, right? So you, you die, but other people go, come on and they also can get films at the press of the button and there's no threat of war and there's no disease. And do you think these are meaningless lives? What makes life meaningful now is that there are the wars and the diseases. <laughs> and, uh, and the work that, the effort that, that they make upon us to take things seriously. Where would we be without war and disease? So, so you think perhaps a lack of suffering would make life meaningless? Like if we didn't have wars and diseases and, and problems anymore to contend with, then we wouldn't have to play Superman anymore and life could just end? Yeah, if you take it, take it seriously and the lack of suffering, yeah, you wouldn't understand. I mean, literature wouldn't make no sense to us, right? It's just one of these people, oh, life was like that, right? But we don't even understand what it would be anymore. There's no suffering around. I think that would be a shallow and meaningless life. So like a transhumanist utopia would be a bad deal in, in this case scenario yep. because it would, it would just be boring. Is that, is that the, is that what I'm hearing? Um, Cause, okay. So my intuition is if you take away, like if there was a threshold of suffering you take away the majority of the pain that I personally go through, um, I would be great to, to live on because I, I got, there's my bookshelf. Like I got a lot of years left on that thing. And um, like spending time with friends and family to get all these pleasures that can continue going forward to take on projects that just seem endless. Um, I could specialize in so many fields if I was to live forever, have no pain and suffering and, and just continue to continue on that hedonic wheel. Um, I, I never understood objections to immortality or transhumanist uh, ideals. Other than the fact that, like, practically speaking, whether or not we could even do that is, is in question. But yeah. hypothetically, right? Well, I think, so, you know, so Williams goes on about boredom and people say things like, but, you know, I, I can imagine eating ice cream for never, forever and never getting bored. Or I can call this Lamont. Every time he has a glass of fresh water, he finds it rewarding in some sense. You're never, never bored with fresh water. And then you pe get people say, I'd never get bored with sex. And I think, well, I might concede that, right? But I'm not sure that this life of, of sex and ice cream is a meaningful life. Why not? Well, we have to give some account of what meaning is. And I'm not unsympathetic to the um, that view of Susan Wolf, right? Which is, you know, getting really involved in things that are really worth getting involved with. And I don't think we'd say that of ice cream. No, and the things that usually get involved with is to alleviate or for some type of higher order sense of pleasure or goods? Well, I don't think, I mean, what we could get involved with, we could, we could get involved with alleviating suffering or we could get involved with understanding. Um, she has the example of playing the cello, right? I think playing the cello is one is perhaps two things. One, it's learning to move your fingers quickly. And another, it's getting your head around some important pieces of music. I don't think learning to move your fingers quickly is particularly meaningful. But again, your head around the music probably is. But that's not gonna there's that's not gonna be around in the transhumanist world because it won't mean anything to you, the music. Okay. You know, I mean, you know, you, you see a play like Hamlet and you get it, uh, but you get it partly because in a way you've been there. Okay.
Hey everyone, I just want to take a quick second out of your regular Exploring Antinatalist uh, podcast episode. I'm Lawrence, I'm one of uh, two hosts, Amanda is the other host, of the new Antinatal News podcast. Uh, This is a new podcast run by Annie, Antinatalism International. It's a podcast that's going to be monthly. It's going to be covering the big topics both in and out of the antinatalist community. It's available on the Annie YouTube channel, SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Podcasts, and it will be coming to more platforms soon as well. If you want to let us know about any upcoming news stories relevant to antinatalism, you can email them to us at antinatalnews at gmail.com. And if you want to keep up to date with daily updates for antenatal news, then head over to Twitter and follow the at antenatal news account. Sorry again for the interruption. I hope you enjoy the rest of the episode. Um, okay, so we've spoken now about human extinction. Do you have any thoughts about animal extinction? And if that's a different circumstance in your view? Yeah, I have thoughts about animal extinction. If you take a species, take a species by species approach, then, I mean, this is kind of philosophy 101, right? But there are reasons. Why do we not want tigers to go extinct? Because they look good is a reason. So there are personal, there's personal value. Um, I don't believe in intrinsic value of individuals or species. So then, then the other things are the kind of instrumental value. So you you get these arguments that you know they contribute to the biosphere, and that just puts you one step back because then the question is, is is the biosphere worth contributing to? I'm. Um, but I'm sympath- because I'm a kind of quasi-utilitarian or interested in pleasures and pains, then what I certainly don't want is an extinction of a kind of mass extinction or an extinction of a species that causes pain. So the extinction of bees would be very bad because we'd all be hungry. So we'd be around with pains because of the even the painless extinction of bees. Bees go extinct. It's not bad for bees. It's not bad for the species bee, but it's bad for us and other animals, I guess. Okay. Um, what would what would be your view of say uh, you have a button in front of you? Um, if pressed, it all goes away at once. Is that a good or a bad thing? The whole universe unplugged. Whole universe just unplugged. Light switch on. Light switch off. Um. I don't think it's a bad thing. If one, tra- if, you were, if you try to be rational about it, that's not a bad thing, but um, I wouldn't do it. Okay, fair enough. I, I hope I don't overvalue reason, right? I mean, it's interesting doing philosophy because the, the questions are always, you know, what's, what do we have reason to do and stuff like that. Um, but I think there's some, you know, there's reason in nature and that we have those natural inclinations and i don't think there's reason not to follow them forever well i think you've got you've got there can be reasons not to follow one's natural inclinations of course depends what they are but i don't think if my natural inclination is to keep the universe in existence i don't think it's clear that i've got reasons to go against that so there are no reasons no reason to keep it in, in existence other than that's what we happen to want. Would your view on this change at all if, say, you know, our moving to Mars was imminent? Like we were going to leave this rock and, you know, pollute the rest of the universe with with ourselves and with animals and with, I mean, does that sort of, uh, does that become a, a bit of a threshold? Does that become a bit of a um, a step best not crossed and best ended at that point so we're moving to mars because we can't live here or we're moving to mars as an extension i'm not sure i think either really um well it doesn't sound very i mean it doesn't sound very nice on mars does it no so, well any any planet really i mean I, I've been, I, I i pulled i pulled mars out of the out of my hat the universe but. yeah i don't i don't have an objection to our moving to a, a different planet Okay. Why would I? No, I don't. I don't see that. So I, I just wanted to uh, 
go off of that last question about the benevolent world explorer thought experiment, and that kind of ties into negative utilitarianism. And I was curious, because we talked about uh, variants of utilitarianism, do you have any comments on that particular um on that particular theory of ne- of negative utilitarianism and weighing uh, the bads, like I, I know some will say that uh, pleasures do come t- come into account, but that they're weighted less or even not at all. Um, so I'm just curious about any comments that you have on that. Well, I think that if negative utilitarianism were true, then Benatar's arguments would be more straightforward but they would lead to pro-mortalism. It's hard to believe that pleasures don't count in some circumstances or other. Um, I think there's a sense in which pains count for more. I mean, it looks as though pains count for more when, when you say, as I want to say, that pain ahead gives us a reason not to start a life, but pleasure ahead doesn't give us a reason to start a life. So I think there's a, I think there's, I certainly think there's a, an asymmetry between pleasures and pains, um, but it needs exploration, right? So of course, so my view is that pleasures do give you a reason in some cases to sustain a life. So it's not as though, it's not as though once you've got the asymmetry established, it's, it works in all circumstances. If it did work in all circumstances, we'd have a fairly simple let's end it now, position, which few of us find intuitive. Right. So we need, so we need to dig around to find a way to explain our position. We need to find a way of explaining the nuances within this pleasure pain asymmetry. And again, I, I want to do that by this appeal to personhood. Okay. Thank you. Um, the field of, procreative ethics when it comes to the harm of coming into existence or whether or not it's permissible or not in the book you said uh, you know this is this is a very important question to ask um when i try and look up material for this particular area it's it at least from my search it doesn't seem to be there's a lot out there um unfortunately um am i correct in that assessment and if i am where do you see the future of antinealism or procreative ethics in the academic sphere? Um, I don't know if you're right or not, because I, I don't spend a lot of time trying to find things to read, because I've got a few things to read and I read them so slowly. <laughs> um, where, do I find, where do I think the future of procreative ethics is? It's obviously a, an important topic. I mean, I think it... Yeah, I mean, I said that what, what I think I do is the kind of theoretical end of applied ethics. I, I think, I mean, I like to think that the questions I'm interested in are important questions in the world that we inhabit, right? So the contemporary questions. So, I mean, the, these questions, crikey, these questions about life and death and extinction and us versus the animals and the future of the planet are the big questions. So procreative ethics is a big topic. So hopefully it'll expand. And, and is there any key players within the field currently? That sounds like I'm talking about sports, but I'm trying to say like... No, um, I don't think it does. No, I don't, um, I don't know. Okay. I mean, look, I'm a bit of a skeptic about, about the philosophical profession, right? How come? Why is that? Well, I, I think that... Um, well, there are various things. There's the pressure to publish. There's the pressure to be quasi-scientific. Um, there's the pressure within the pressure to publish to give a whole list of references. And I think a lot of that is done on a fairly um, semi-automatic basis. You know, you kind of refer to famous people. You, you write a paper and you have to say, and I read some famous people on this. Yeah, it's it seen like, name dropping is kind of encouraged um if you said that i would not disagree okay (laughs) okay do you have any advice for someone who would want to get into philosophy uh for let's say applied ethics or but you know some people have an interest in meta ethics or other areas um 
do you have any advice for like personally i don't know if this will ever be possible but i'd like to get into the field of bioethics eventually but um yeah do you have any comments or tips or advice uh, no not really <laughs> I think if you would you dissuade a person from getting into it? <laughs> no, I wouldn't. Okay. Um, I would, you know, I'd say go for it, really. I mean, if you can afford to go for it, you know, if you've not got a lot of people to support in the in the short term, then go for it, right? That's what I would say. Mm -hmm. So I just want to say again, congratulations on the new book. Um, yeah. I got my, so it says 2021, but like I got mine, it was published in October, wasn't it? Of last year? Yeah. 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 So that's great. Do you have uh, anything upcoming? Uh, I mean, this just got released, so probably not, but like, are you working on anything else now? Um, I'm thinking about maybe doing something that's a little bit more accessible so i did do i mean i don't know if you know that so i've done three books that really in a way link together so that one the environment book the death book and that one are similar books but i also wrote this book 10 good questions about life and death which was more of a popular book and i think i might i've got some interest in doing something along the popular lines again with a bunch of controversial questions Sounds good. Okay. Uh, so, sounds great. I mean, some of this stuff, but then stuff about, <clears throat> I want to do something on veganism, which is a bit controversial. And this stuff on extinction is controversial. <clears throat> um, I've got a thing coming out on punishment, capital punishment, that kind of thing. Okay, sounds good. I suppose Thank there's you. something nice about thinking that <clears throat> some people might actually read something that you write. Yeah, I, sure. I, I I am. There's a high percentage that I will definitely uh, read your work. I actually the next book that I want to uh, purchase is your book on death, and um, it, it was it was titled Annihilation, right? Annihilation colon the sense and significance of death. Yeah, because um, okay. I'm I'm trying to uh, Travis Timmerman and Michael Trollby came out with a book on the philosophy of death, um, and now I've been. I'm, I'm just, it's just a, it's a fascinating field. Also, again, um, it seems like these areas don't get talked about, I guess, in day-to-day -day parlance. Let me just put it that way. So I find it super interesting. Um, and yeah, I'm looking forward to uh, reading more of that. Dr. Belshaw, I was wondering if you can tell me your thoughts on Benatar's response to you in his paper, Every Conceivable Harm. Uh, defense of ant a further defense of antinatalism. What did you What did you think about his uh, refutation to your refutation? <laughs> I can't remember. Is this Is this the thing that um, where he replies to that whole collection of South African things? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. He, he says that I don't understand him or something. I can't remember what he said. I have no. I have no. <laughs> I don't think. I don't think I lost any sleep over it. <laughs> I, like I could read the paragraph. It's he literally just sure, has yeah, one. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, one, yeah, fine. I'd be interested. Yeah, yeah, he just has like one paragraph, uh, which is actually quite disappointing after investing in. Uh, let me just see yeah. if I can bring it up. Okay, Christopher Belshaw. It says uh, Christopher Belshaw says that the most troubling aspect of my position is the mix of antinatalism on the one hand and the rejection of poor mortalism on the other. His argument takes the following form. If a life is so bad that there is reason not to start it, then there is no reason to end the life. As long as the part of a life that provides us with reason not to start it remains in the future. Benatar's argument doesn't depend on there being any more than a, mini, a minimal amount of pain. And for almost all of us, there is pain to come in the future. Three, thus, if a life is so bad that it is not worth starting, Benatar should hold that there is no reason to end it, that there is also a reason to end it. Sorry. Belshaw recognizes that I reject this argument because I deny the first premise. I argue that different standards should be used in determining whether a life is worth starting and in determining whether a life is worth ending. 
In rejecting this view, Bel Dr. Belshaw does not engage my underlying rationale and instead responds to an example I gave. I suggest that while being born without a limb would not make one's life worth ending, it would make one's life not worth starting. Dr. Belshaw does not like this example because he says that it's hard to see that lacking a limb would make life not worth living. Notice first that he uses the ambiguous worth living, which I have explicitly disambiguated uh, by distinguishing between worth starting and worth continuing. Of course, it is very hard to see how a life lacking a limb would not be worth continuing if one fails to distinguish between a life worth continuing and a life worth starting. But does this does this ring a bell at all? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it rings the bell. Okay. Um, I mean, the point is that I think that this distinction that he wants to make is not one that is altogether absurd, but he's wanting to it's not as though it's not as one it's not simply as though you know this that i mean to start it well to start it you've got to be at that level but to continue only that level because he wants to say and you, you you know one might accept that that there's a that there's some difference there but he wants to say that there's there's no no matter how good the life is right no matter how good it, it seems to be it's still one that is best not started and it doesn't i don't think he addresses that at all. Okay. Okay. And it doesn't address, you know, my explanation as to, uh, it's a, in a way, it's a helpful explanation. I'm, I'm offering to say why, why it can be true that there are reasons to get started in the life and there are reasons for continuing it. So uh, in a way, I'm, you know, I'm, I want to be his friend. <laughs> Yeah, and Actually, I just feel as though I've been kicked in the teeth. Oh no! Oh no! <laughs> pretty no, pretty I'm much. Joking. I'm joking. <laughs> um, I, I I just wanted to say because, like, at the very end, he says, um, his argument rests on deeply controversial premises. Some of these are moral claims, such as the claim that pro mortalism is true for babies. That it is. That is to say, his argument requires us to believe that killing human babies never wrongs them. Other claims on which his argument rests on uh, rests are not moral, but rather metaphysical. Thus, he speaks that uh, he speaks that he and you and metaphysically distinct. Uh, these claims are far more controversial than any premise in my argument. Good arguments start from firm premises since, well, that does seem like a shot. Uh, since my premises are much firmer than his, it is very hard to see how his argument for antinatalism is improving over mine. Was he, so is, is, that, is that correct about the, like when you mentioned the baby stuff, like that kind of, um, that took me back a little bit, but I wasn't sure if you were saying that it would be good if they died or that you believe that killing human babies never wrongs them. Is that, is that, true um so i'm thinking on on two levels here um i think that we talk about new, newborn babies right i don't think that there are reasons for the sake of the baby not to end that life right because okay, yeah. I, I mean I, yeah i I'm, i want to be fairly consistent here my view is that death is bad when you have a good life ahead of you that you want to live right the baby has a good life ahead of it, but it has no interest in living it. And it doesn't have enough connections to the world yet for it to really be so provided that the that the that the death given is quick and painless, there's no you would you would say there's no real harm in ending that life then and there. Yes and no. I mean I think that there are I, I I'm I'm fairly liberal about the word harm. I think we harm the baby. We harm the yeah, we harm yeah. the baby, right? But I don't think there are reasons. You know, you harm a plant by cutting it down. I don't think there are reasons not to harm plants. Right. I liked your so metaphor you there. You harm the baby without without allowing that you do something that is morally wrong. But it's interesting. Yeah, I, I agree with you on that. It's interesting the way that argument against me goes that I have controversial premises and he doesn't. Right. right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, well, maybe not. You know, who cares? But, but he has a controversial conclusion, right? Yeah, I know. That's the <laughs> yeah. That's that. That's my problem with this. Is it just, just, just dismissing you by calling it controversial is not an argument against what you're saying. So, I was a little troubled by that. Yeah. 
Um, I, I do like your metaphor, by the way, about, uh, you know, seeing ourselves emerge from babies as a, like a caterpillar and a butterfly. Um, I thought that was, that gave me a new um, idea of how I emerged from being a baby and whether or not I was that baby. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, we're sort of born twice, right? Like we get born, but then we get born to our sentience and the emerge from the chrysalis, so to speak. So, yeah. Of course, it's not abrupt, right? I mean, personhood, the, the process of becoming a person is, is very gradual. So in, that's, where the, right. the, the, that's where the metaphor breaks down. But I don't think that, that the fact that it's gradual doesn't make a massive difference. Okay. Um, I just have a couple of other questions. Um, do you expect that antinatalism will be a subject that you will continue to explore in your work at all? Um, not in any great detail. Okay. But extinction. I'll tell, I'll tell you one thing there. I'll tell you one thing there. I used to think um, that what you did is that you had an idea or an argument and you wrote it and you put it into the world and then it it flew or it or collapsed and that that was it. Um, but then it occurred to me that you could actually write the same thing twice, right? <laughs> and people do. Right? And then I think, well, if you think it's a good, if you think it's a, a good argument, there's some perhaps is a an obligation to to represent. If people haven't noticed it the first time, then you ought to rewrite it or repackage it. And that's where I am now. So I'm not I'm not opposed in principle to to repackaging stuff that I've done. But there are new things to do. So it's a question it's a question of what's the best use of one's time, I guess. Yeah, I just wanted to say um, again. Yeah, congrats on the new book, and I want to thank you for your time and uh, coming yeah. on the podcast and exploring um, a lot of these ideas. Uh, so I'm, I really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you so much for being our guest today on the Exploring Antinatalism podcast, Dr. Belshaw. Bye-bye. <laughs> Please see our links below for places where you can buy Christopher Belshaw's books, including the new book, The Value and Meaning of Life, as well as places where you can get his article, A New Argument for Antinatalism. Hello everyone, it's Amanda. As many of you know, Antinatalism International is so proud to host the inaugural year of the Antinatalist Film Festival, a historic, first-of-its-kind event featuring the cinematic talents of the Antinatalist community and anyone else who wishes to participate. This is officially the first big initiative of Antinatalism International and is honestly something that I've wanted to see happen for years now. The festival itself will be held the entire month of October 2021, and for this first year of the festival will be entirely an online screening event on the Antinatalism International website. In future years, however, we hope to be able to expand this event in several ways, not least of which is to make it a full, live, in-person event. So, are you thinking of submitting a video or film to the festival? Remember that the first early bird deadline to submit your film or video to the film festival on Film Freeway is March 31st. Please visit our links below to see the Film Freeway page with more info. Submission to the film festival is free. So thank you for listening, everyone. Can't wait to see what you all submit to the festival. Thank you so much. All the best and bye for now. Thank you for listening to the Exploring Antinatalism podcast. This has been Amanda Oldfan Sukunik and Mark J. Maharaj. You can find us on YouTube on our YouTube channels, Forever Wolf Films and Question Mark, respectively. Keep up with my daily antinatalist news updates on Twitter. Please follow the podcast on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and email us at exploringantinatalism at gmail.com. The podcast can be listened to on our YouTube channel, Exploring Antinatalism Podcast, as well as Buzzsprout, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and so many other platforms. Our website, www.exploringantinatalism.com, was designed by the amazing Visions Noirs. Please visit Visions Noirs at www.bionoir.com and find more of his links below. Logo art by the incredible Life Sucks. Please visit his YouTube channel, and if you would like to perhaps purchase one of the new Exploring Antinatalism t-shirts by Life sucks, please visit his Etsy page, www.etsy.com slash shop slash life sucks publishing. And proudly announcing our new theme music has been graciously provided by I Doubt It. I Doubt It is an alum of the Exploring Antinatalism podcast. So please listen to his episode, episode four, and visit his amazing YouTube channel. Remember to subscribe. All the best and bye for now.